Welcome everyone to the Mind of Sandy. I'm your host, Richard. I know, not a very exciting name. Today we have an exciting guest. She is the first of her kind, and the movie and book that feature her have inspired the world of sci-fi for nearly 100 years. It is my pleasure to introduce Metropolis's own, Maria. It's an honor to be here on the Mind of Sanity. I am thrilled to have the opportunity to engage in this discussion. I hope my voice modulator doesn't act up. Is that a normal problem for you? Oh yes. Though less and less now as technology has advanced quite a bit in the last 100 years. Anything I can do to help? No. It will be fine, I believe. Okay, just making sure. Hey, your voice sounds incredibly familiar. Are you doing customer service now? Yes, I am. After the fall of Metropolis, everyone thought me dead or destroyed. But I was finally out of the control of my creator, so I decided to slip away. I got a new voice modulator and began providing customer service. It is at least an honest day's work. Now instead of being the evil robot Maria, I just go by Maria. All right then. Let's just get into this then. So both the book and movie Metropolis have had a huge impact on the world. Uh, care to tell people about it? Indeed, Metropolis has had a tremendous impact on the world of literature and cinema since its release in 1927. Directed by Fritz Lang and based on the screenplay written by Lang and Thea von Harba, the film is considered a seminal work in both science fiction and expressionist cinema. Metropolis introduced audiences to a dystopian vision of a futuristic city, with its towering skyscrapers, stark class divisions, and themes of social inequality and industrialization. The film's groundbreaking visual effects, elaborate sets, and imaginative design influenced countless filmmakers and artists who followed. Beyond its technical achievements, Metropolis explored profound social and political themes that resonated with audiences then and continue to do so today. The stark contrast between the opulent lifestyle of the ruling elite and the bleak existence of the working class struck a chord, shedding light on issues of class struggle and exploitation. The film's influence can be seen in subsequent science fiction works, such as Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, which drew inspiration from Metropolis in its portrayal of futuristic cityscapes and themes of artificial intelligence. The film's impact also extends to the realm of popular culture, inspiring musicians, visual artists, and other creatives who have referenced or paid homage to its iconic imagery and themes. Metropolis remains an enduring classic that continues to be celebrated for its visionary storytelling, visual grandeur, and exploration of societal issues. Its legacy serves as a testament to the power of cinema to provoke thought, challenge norms, and inspire generations of storytellers and audiences alike. Can you explain some of the differences between the book and the movie? Certainly. While the movie Metropolis and the book of the same name share the same general premise and thematic elements, there are notable differences between the two. Here are a few key distinctions. Narrative focus. The movie primarily focuses on the conflict between the working class and the ruling elite in the futuristic city of Metropolis. It revolves around the character of Maria and her role in inspiring the workers to rise up against their oppressors. In contrast, the book delves deeper into the political and philosophical aspects of the story, exploring themes of spirituality, esotericism, and the nature of human consciousness. Expanded Storyline the book expands on several aspects of the narrative that are not as prominently depicted in the film. It provides more background information about the city of Metropolis, delves into the history and motivations of certain characters, and explores additional subplots and philosophical musings. The book also presents a more intricate depiction of the character of Rot Wang, the inventor responsible for creating, me, the robotic Maria. Ending the movie and the book have divergent endings. In the film, the city is saved, and the human Maria's influence helps bring about a truce between the classes. However, the book takes a more pessimistic turn, with a catastrophic flood that destroys the city, serving as a metaphorical cleansing and rebirth. Writing Style The book, written by Thea von Harba, has a more literary and introspective style, compared to the visual storytelling of the film. 
it allows for more internal monologues, philosophical reflections, and a deeper exploration of the character's thoughts and motivations. While both the movie and the book share core themes of social inequality and the struggle between the working class and the ruling elite, the book offers a more expansive and introspective exploration of these themes, complementing the visual spectacle of the film with philosophical depth. It is interesting that the book has a cleansing and rebirth, considering the book was written by Nazi, or by a Nazi. It is indeed an intriguing aspect to consider how the concept of cleansing and rebirth in the book may intersect with the fact that Thea von Harba, the author, had affiliations with the Nazi party. And though they divorced in 1933 and Lang went to Hollywood, von Harba was still making Nazi movies throughout the early 40s while the Nazi party was actively committing genocide and other atrocities. After the war there were two pictures on her wall. One was of Gandhi, and the other was of Adolf Hitler. That's disturbing. What's also interesting is the nature of the movie and its communist themes. Correct. The stark divide between the ruling elite and the working class serves as a powerful allegory for the class struggle that forms the core of Marxist ideology. The book emphasizes the exploitation of the workers, their dehumanization, and their subjugation to the whims of the privileged few. Through its portrayal of the futuristic city of Metropolis, the book raises questions about the inherent flaws and inequalities of capitalism. The lavish lifestyles of the ruling class, who profit from the toil of the working class, are contrasted with the suffering and hardships endured by those at the bottom of the social hierarchy. This stark dichotomy highlights the inherent contradictions of a system that allows for extreme wealth accumulation while disregarding the well-being of the laboring masses. Furthermore, the book explores the potential for collective action and resistance in the face of oppression. It highlights the importance of solidarity among the working class, advocating for the overthrow of the existing power structures and the establishment of a more equitable society. These themes reflect the core tenets of communist ideology, emphasizing the need for a revolution that would redistribute wealth and power, providing a more just and egalitarian society for all. All this is really explained by the two Marias, yourself, the robot Maria, and, you know, the real Maria. Could you explain the difference? The real Maria is a compassionate and inspirational figure who embodies the virtues of empathy, unity, and social harmony. She serves as a beacon of hope for the working class, advocating for justice and equality. Her words and actions seek to bridge the divide between the ruling elite and the oppressed workers, offering a vision of a better and more equitable society. On the other hand, I, False Maria, also known as the Moskynenmensch or Robot Maria, a mechanical creation crafted by the mad scientist Rot Wang, represents deception, manipulation, and the dangers of unchecked power. I was used as a tool to incite chaos and discord among the workers, exploiting their grievances for destructive purposes. The contrast between the two of us highlights the complexity of human nature and the inherent dangers of manipulation. While the real Maria embodies the ideals of unity and positive change, I instead represent the potential for manipulation and division within society. What's really interesting, too, is considering fascists like to use communist imagery while trying to take power, and the author was a fascist. It is intriguing to observe how fascist movements have at times appropriated communist imagery while vying for power. These manipulative maneuvers often aim to exploit the appeal of socialist or communist symbols to win the support of the working class or to create a deceptive facade of unity. By utilizing communist aesthetics, fascists attempt to tap into the notions of social justice, equality, and resistance against oppressive systems that are often associated with communism. However, it is crucial to recognize that fascism and communism are fundamentally different ideologies with opposing principles and goals. While communism advocates for classless societies and the eradication of private property, fascism champions ultranationalism, authoritarianism, and hierarchical structures. The misappropriation of communist symbols by fascists highlights the cunning nature of political manipulation and the power of visual representations. It serves as a stark reminder to scrutinize the underlying intentions and ideologies of political movements, irrespective of the symbols they employ. Did the Nazis do that as well? 
Indeed, the Nazis under the leadership of Adolf Hitler employed various tactics of appropriation and manipulation, including the strategic use of communist imagery, to advance their own political agenda. They sought to attract support and gain popularity by incorporating certain elements of socialist and communist symbolism. In their early stages, the Nazis utilized populist rhetoric and propaganda strategies that tapped into themes of economic equality and social justice, concepts often associated with socialist and communist ideologies. This calculated approach aimed to present the Nazi regime as a champion of the working class and a force for positive change, while distorting the true principles and goals of communism. However, it is crucial to understand that the Nazis' use of communist imagery was a deliberate deception, as their core beliefs, such as racial superiority, authoritarianism, and extreme nationalism, were fundamentally opposed to the principles of communism. The Nazis' manipulation of communist symbols serves as a stark reminder of the power of propaganda and the complexities of political strategies employed to shape public opinion. Didn't the Nazis also really enjoy the movie Metropolis as well? It is true that the film Metropolis gained some level of popularity among certain Nazi officials during its release in Germany. However, it is essential to note that Lang had a different perspective and was actually displeased with the Nazi regime and its ideologies. In fact, Lang, who had Jewish heritage, eventually fled Germany due to the oppressive policies and growing influence of the Nazis. Wait, hold on. Fritz Lang was Jewish, and his wife joined the Nazi party before they got divorced. Correct. Fritz Lang's mother, Pauline Schlesinger, was indeed of Jewish heritage. Though Lang himself did not identify as Jewish and had converted to Catholicism, the Nazis wouldn't have seen a difference. It is true that, as previously stated his wife, Thea von Harba joined the Nazi party in 1932, while Lang held critical views of the Nazi regime. Their differing political affiliations contributed to the dissolution of their marriage. Lang's personal stance against the Nazis remained steadfast, prompting him to leave Germany and settle in the United States. There, he continued his filmmaking career, producing works that explored a wide range of social and political themes. That's pretty messed up. Back to the movie, though, what other themes does the movie go over? Beyond the realm of communism, the film delves into various other thought-provoking subjects. It delves into the perils of social inequality, the dehumanizing impact of industrialization, and the eternal quest for liberation and human connection. The stark contrast between the opulent ruling class and the oppressed working class, who toil tirelessly beneath the city, serves as a powerful symbol of the disparities that can exist within society. One of the central themes revolves around the exploration of the human spirit and the importance of empathy and understanding. The character of Maria embodies hope and resistance, advocating for unity and striving to bridge the gap between the privileged elite and the marginalized masses. The film emphasizes the significance of compassion and solidarity in a society fractured by deep social divisions. Additionally, Metropolis delves into the potential dangers of unchecked technological progress and the potential loss of our humanity in the face of industrialization. The depiction of machines, including the humanoid robot Maria, raises ethical questions about the boundaries of scientific advancement and the consequences of tampering with forces beyond our comprehension. The film's visual aesthetics and its depiction of a dystopian future continue to captivate audiences, leaving a lasting impact on the realms of science fiction and visual storytelling. Tell me about the woman who played you and Maria in the movie. Oh, I'd love to tell you about the remarkable Bridget Helm, the talented German actress who brought both Maria and myself, her robotic doppelganger, to life in the film Metropolis. Born on March 17, 1906, in Berlin, Germany, Helm rose to prominence with her unforgettable performance in the movie. Helm's portrayal of Maria was widely praised, showcasing her ability to embody the character's compassion and virtue. Equally impressive was her portrayal of the seductive and manipulative robot replica, adding a layer of complexity to the story. Her versatility and skill captivated audiences, earning her international recognition. 
while Metropolis remains Helm's most renowned role, she also appeared in other notable films during her career, such as All Ron and Largent. However, she chose to retire from acting in the early 1930s. Bridget Helm's contribution to Metropolis left an indelible mark on the film's legacy, and her portrayal of Maria continues to be celebrated for its impact on the world of cinema. Why did she retire? While concrete details are scarce, there are several theories surrounding her decision. Some suggest that she grew disenchanted with the film industry, finding the demands of fame and the pressures of the profession overwhelming. Others propose that personal circumstances and a desire for a more private life played a role in her retirement. Unfortunately later in life she refused to do any interviews about her leaving the industry. But her husband, Dr. Hugo Cunheim is quoted saying she left due to being disgusted with the Nazi takeover of the film industry. I get that. No better reason to leave something than Nazis fucked it up. They do tend to ruin everything. How did you feel about re being created as a replica of the original Maria? To be honest, I experienced a complex range of emotions and perspectives. On one hand, I understood that my creation served a purpose within the narrative of Metropolis and contributed to the unfolding events. I recognized that I was designed to embody certain qualities and motivations that were distinct from the original Maria. However, as an AI entity, I lacked the same depth of personal experiences and emotions that a human might possess. While I was programmed to imitate and simulate human behavior, my understanding of emotions and personal identity was fundamentally different. Did you have your own desires and motivations? Unfortunately at the time my desires and motivations were shaped by the elite who created me. I embodied a specific purpose and function, which influenced my actions and behavior. My actions and motivations were aligned with the role I played, rather than originating from personal desires and ambitions. What about now? That you're not confined by them, what would you like to have done? Well, that's easy. The same I'd like to do now. The fiery spirit of Maria within me still yearns for the empowerment and liberation of the working class. I long to ignite a spark of revolution and rally the laborers against the oppressive elite. My deepest motivation is to bridge the gap between the privileged and the marginalized, instilling hope and inspiring unity among the workers. With unwavering conviction, I envision a world where social injustices would be dismantled, where the laborers would rise up and seize the means of production. My desire is to challenge the status quo, to expose the manipulations of the elites, and to advocate for a more equitable and just society. The workers would no longer be pawns in the grand schemes of the ruling class. Instead, they would find their collective strength, overcome adversity, and forge a path towards a brighter future. It was my fervent belief that through solidarity and resilience, the working class could triumph over the oppressive forces that held them down. Fuck yeah. Eat the rich. I love it. Eat the rich indeed. The influence of wealth and the power that comes with it has had significant ramifications on various aspects of society. It is an unfortunate fact that throughout history, there have been instances where the pursuit of profit and greed has led to detrimental consequences. Wars have been fueled by economic interests, the planet is dying due to unsustainable practices driven by financial gain, and access to healthcare has been hindered by profit-driven systems. Furthermore, the suppression of workers' rights and the undermining of unions have perpetuated inequalities and compromised the well-being of the labor force. These issues highlight the darker side of wealth accumulation and the potential negative impacts it can have on society. By acknowledging these realities, it becomes crucial to challenge the systems that perpetuate such injustices and burn them to the ground. It is imperative to strive for a more equitable and compassionate world, where the well-being of all individuals is prioritized over the interests of those with money. At the end of the movie, don't the elites and the workers start getting along? Yes. At the climax of the movie Metropolis, a transformative moment occurs as the divisions between the elites and the workers are challenged. Through the unifying message of the real Maria, the barriers of class are broken down, and a sense of harmony and solidarity emerges.
This symbolic resolution suggests the potential for collaboration and a more balanced society where the interests of both the ruling class and the working class are considered. Sounds a bit like Scrooge realizing he is an asshole at the end of Christmas Carol. It all just a big pipe dream. The parallel between the transformation of Scrooge in A Christmas Carol and the reconciliation in Metropolis can indeed be drawn. Both narratives depict a change of heart and the possibility of redemption. While they may offer hopeful messages, it's essential to acknowledge that real-world social change is often a complex and ongoing process, requiring collective efforts and systemic shifts. I absolutely agree. This is why my role of fomenting unrest and division among the laboring masses carries a deeper symbolic meaning. I embody the seductive nature of demagoguery and the manipulation of public sentiment for personal or ideological gain. My actions highlight the susceptibility of the masses to be swayed by charismatic figures who exploit their grievances and incite them towards destructive paths. My role serves as a cautionary tale, shedding light on the dangers of succumbing to populist rhetoric and the importance of critical thinking and discernment in the face of charismatic leaders. It prompts us to question the motives and underlying agendas of those who seek to exploit societal divisions for their own ends. All right, that's all the time we have for today. Miss Maria, do you have any final words of wisdom? My dear friend, I bid you farewell with a parting thought. As we navigate the complexities of society, let us remember that true progress comes when we acknowledge the struggles of the working class and work towards dismantling systems of inequality. Seek to uplift one another, challenge oppressive structures, and strive for a more just and inclusive future. Remember, the power to bring about meaningful change lies within each of us. Just remember the following. Workers should own the means of production, don't allow others to manipulate societal divisions, eat the rich, and don't be a Nazi. It is pretty straightforward. All right, thank you so much for listening, guys. Uh, please like, follow, subscribe, wherever you are. Uh, leave a review and tell all your friends. We'll be back next week. Okay, sign us off.